Hi, and welcome to this episode of Encountering Jesus. My name is Cindy Johnston, and I'm your host. This is the Heaven's Door audiobook series. Here's the book. Heaven's Door by Cindy Johnston Copyright 2020 All rights reserved. No part of this book may be reproduced without permission. Chapter 21 Giant Hamster Ball A few days later, I was with Jesus at the beach house when he said he had another surprise for me. He took me out, and we walked along the beautiful beach until we came to a jungle-like area. Here, Jesus pointed toward a small trail. We followed the little footpath, which I believe was a dried-up creek bed, until we came to a dense patch of underbrush. When Jesus pushed some of the bushes aside, it revealed a hole that went straight down into the earth. Jesus motioned for me to come to him, and then helped me slip down into the tiny hole. He came down right behind me, then we moved through the small tunnel in single file. The passageway reminded me of a drainage shaft. This thought had me speculating that it might be the underground portion of the dry creek bed. The passage fluctuated between three to four feet high, so we spent most of the hike bent over or crawling. It was a relief to reach the end of the tunnel and come out into a place with enough room for us to stand. The medium-sized cavern we came into would have been pitch black except for the sun shining through a long open strip at the top of the cave. The area was full of pebbles and rocks of all sizes. The rounded hand-sized stones formed a little pool area on the left, while to the right, a mound of huge boulders nearly reached the ceiling. The shallow pool was about six feet in diameter when I first looked at it, but now it was growing in size. I found it fascinating to watch as the water bubbled up in the middle then overflowed its sides. I assumed that underneath the pool was another tunnel that connected it to the ocean, which would explain how the tide was coming in. Before I could be concerned about the rising water, Jesus began to climb the mound. I followed behind him as we headed up to a hollow sphere wedged firmly in the rocks. Jesus twisted the lid open, then I realized we would be getting inside. After we climbed in, Jesus put the top back on and twisted it shut. I found all of this a bit amusing as the whole thing reminded me of a hamster ball, except there were no air holes. I'm sure there was a look of shock on my face when I realized we had limited oxygen. Jesus seemed unconcerned. We have just enough air to make it until all the water flows back out. I couldn't help but think this was a weird and unexpected turn of events. When I looked down and saw the water quickly filling the cave, I wasn't too concerned. But then, when it reached the bottom of the sphere, I felt a genuine moment of claustrophobia. I looked at Jesus. He smiled, opened his arms, and I moved inside them. Instantly, all fear was gone. Within a few minutes, the water was all around. I was surprised at all the little fish we saw. I enjoyed watching them, and I think they were curious about us too. After a few more minutes, the water receded, and Jesus opened the lid for us. I was thankful to get out of the little bubble and then also the cave. I admit I was far more excited about flying off a cliff than being underwater in a hamster ball. Yet I did it, and it was another precious time with Jesus I'll never forget. All of these experiences with Jesus build my trust in him. The more I spend time interacting with Jesus and seeing what my life means to him, the more I'm filled with purpose and joy. This new heavenly perspective has radically changed my view of my life on this earth, which brings me to the humor and subtle meaning of the hamster ball in that last encounter. When you think about it, doesn't a hamster running in circles make a good illustration of how some of us spend our lives? For me personally, I know I've worked hard to please God and be successful here on earth. Life is fleeting, like a passing mist. It is like trying to catch hold of a breath all vanishes like a vapor, everything is a great vanity. What good does it do anyone to work so hard again and again, sun up to sundown? 
all his labor to gain but a little. One generation comes, another goes, but the earth continues to remain. Ecclesiastes 1 verses 2 to 4, The Voice. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6 verses 19 to 21 NIV. I know I'm repeating myself, but Jesus' heart really is the most beautiful treasure we can ever find. Looking back on the mining story, I'm amazed that Jesus was discovering my heart gems to be so rare and magnificent while I was doing the same with his. I feel blessed every time I think of Jesus being so sweet. I'm seeing the evidence that Jesus is winning my heart in all the things I do. Often, I find myself stopping to check that I'm still in sync with his heart. I find I'm so passionate about him that I eagerly want to do all he asks of me and want him to remove everything in my life that is not drawing me closer to him. What a profound mystery that Jesus can take such a willful selfish heart as mine and transform it into one that no longer wants its own way. For we cannot change our own hearts. Not with all our Christian striving, serving, or even Bible reading can we do it. I once thought I could, but now I see how shallow I was in doing everything in my own strength and in my own way. I'm convinced that these types of heart changes can only be done by Jesus and only through deep intimacy with him. That is why I feel it is vital for us to find heaven's door and enter into the secret place so we might know him personally. I believe it is only there that we will learn how to truly love him with all our heart, soul, and mind. Chapter 22 Tiny Flying Horses The following story takes place in my little one-room beach house. I always smile when I think of this place as it holds such fond memories. I've told you before that I had a hard time accepting Jesus as human. Well, it was at this little beach house that I began to see just how sweet and ordinary Jesus could be. But that wasn't the most shocking thing I discovered. The incredible truth that still breaks my heart is that Jesus, through such humility, makes himself vulnerable to us so that we can know him personally. When I understood the degree to which Jesus needs our love, it left me completely undone. I cried for days, I still do. Every time I see his precious humble heart, I can't help but cry. I will probably do this all through eternity. Now let's get to the story. One of the things I enjoyed about the little beach house was the character it had. It was a tiny house, hardly much more than a living room and kitchen if you'll remember. The living room furniture was in a wide, U shape with a worn couch facing the big picture window and two small mismatched chairs on either side. There was a simple brown coffee table in the middle of the furniture resting on an old-timey crocheted rug. The final touch was a gently used afghan that rested on the back of the couch. It seems the brown, gold, and orange colors didn't match the room, but the rippled pattern was timeless, and the blanket so homey it didn't matter about the colors. Many days Jesus and I would hang out there on the old couch while we looked out the big window as we talked. I want to remind you that often when I would allow Jesus full access to my heart, I would become very childlike. There are reasons for this, but I will spend more time talking about that in the last chapter. For now, just know this is happening in this next story. One day Jesus and I were sitting on the old couch enjoying each other's company. Suddenly, his face lit up like he just remembered something exciting. It was such a cute animated expression with his eyes twinkling so merrily that I was enchanted, and my heart became so happy. He jumped up. I'll be right back, he spoke, rushing out the door, leaving it standing wide open. Within minutes he came back with his hands cupped over something. Again, he failed to close the door, but this time his hands were full. He slowly made his way to the couch, taking care not to jar whatever he was holding. 
Jesus came and sat beside me and held out his hands. I was sure what was in them must be another animal, and after having seen so many unusual ones, I sat up straighter, eager to know what he was holding. When he pulled his hands apart, my breath caught as a tiny horse instantly took flight. It was chestnut color, and its body looked just like a real horse. The horse's body was a little smaller than a matchbox, for those of you who still know what that is. I would guess the horse was a little over one inch long. It had two sets of wings that reminded me of the dragonflies, but they were moving so fast I couldn't be sure. The wings made a buzzing sound like an insect, and I was fascinated by everything about this remarkable creature. However, my joy was cut short, as it appeared there was something wrong. The poor animal could only rise above Jesus' hands by a few inches before it started to land again. Jesus gave me a knowing look, I brought him to you because he's hurt. He won't make it if he doesn't get better. My heart ached at the thought, and hot tears stung my eyes. Then suddenly, something hard to explain happened. It was as if Jesus couldn't bear my grief. His love came rushing inside my heart to comfort and guide me, lest I miss his plans. I've often found that when I'm with Jesus in the heavens, and my heart is so open and filled with love for him, my childlike faith draws him to me in ways I cannot fully understand. During these times, my thoughts offer little to no resistance to Jesus as he guides them along, much like pushing a small boat on the surface of the water. I feel such peace and reassurance like a child carried through a storm. There are no words spoken out loud or in my mind during these times, but our hearts talk to each other just the same. Could we heal him? My heart whispered to his. Because we were one, I already knew his answer before I even asked. Jesus smiled at me and recaptured the precious horse in his hands. I knew to put my hands over his. I remembered from the times before what to say, so I commanded the tiny horse to be healed in Jesus' name. I took my hands off Jesus and waited with bated breath to see what would happen. When Jesus opened his hands, the winged creature instantly flew above our heads. After zipping about the room a few times, it left out the open door. I was so excited I could have clapped with joy. I told Jesus that we would have to get some more sweet creatures so the little guy would have company. And Jesus did exactly that. He brought more of the miniature horses, and they all joined the first one. You could tell they were so happy to be with each other, and that made me happy. Maui Dolphins Most of my encounters with Jesus were so distant from my life on earth there was no checking them to see if they were factual. But this next story offered me a chance to get some concrete proof that my experiences with Jesus were genuine. It was another story that happened back when I spent a lot of time at the beach house. On this particular day, I was in a lovely cotton sundress. It had a bright yellow print with big fuchsia flowers. My hair was up in a ponytail, and I had a tiara on, as that was something Jesus always insisted I wear. One of my favorite things to do was to walk along the wet beach with my shoes off. On this day, I was barefoot, and looking along the shoreline for shells and other treasures in the damp sand. The sun was setting in front of us, which made the colors and ambience so peaceful and dreamy. Jesus also had on casual clothes. His khaki shorts were knee-length with deep pockets, and his short-sleeved shirt was a simple beige color. Though the top was collarless, it did have a small slit just below his neck. The whole outfit looked very comfortable as his oversized loose shirt would flap in the ocean breeze. I thought it all was the perfect beachcombing apparel, though it was not at all what you would expect Jesus to be wearing. Oh, but he did have on sandals, I think we all picture Jesus in sandals. Jesus and I were strolling hand in hand when suddenly my eyes were drawn out to see where two animals jumped high out of the water. From what I could tell, they looked very tiny, but had the markings of whales. They had the white and black patterns that reminded me of those you see on orcas, 
but none of the sea creatures on my world looked like killer whales. Yet, the sun was setting right behind where I saw them, which made it too hard to determine anything for sure. I got so excited about this I grabbed Jesus' arm. Were those two tiny whales? They're dolphins, Jesus looked at me with his precious smile and merriment in his eyes. They looked just like killer whales, I corrected him. He lifted his head and pursed his lips as he nodded in agreement. They are the smallest dolphin on your planet. I brought the dolphins here because they're going extinct. Keeping them here, I can preserve the species. I knew for a fact that Jesus was filling my world with a wide variety of animals from many other worlds, most of which were endangered or going extinct on their own planet. But this was the first time he brought anything from Earth. I was surprised that such beautiful creatures were dying out, and I had never heard about it. I brought you two females and one male, Jesus told me. Putting my hand over my eyes to block the sun, I searched the horizon, hoping to see the dolphins jump again. But they never did. After that, it was hard for me to stay focused on my time with Jesus because I wanted to look on the internet to find more about these small dolphins. When I did, I found that Maui dolphins live off the coast of New Zealand. As I am writing this book, there are only 47 left. Also, some of them look very much like killer whales. This revelation quieted many of my doubts about the reality of these adventures. It is a strange thing how our faith works. I've often asked Jesus to show me something that would confirm the truth of all these incredible adventures, and in response, he has given me very little concrete proof. Most of the time, he has given me a personal word or a meaningful gift. They have been like bread crumbs or bits of manna in that they would sustain me for about a day. Then at my request, he would do the same thing again the next day. As I've studied the word and learned from Jesus, I have found that the miracles he does won't keep my heart close to his. It is our intimacy and daily relationship that does. As I find my delight in him, he will occasionally give me more evidence like this fantastic dolphin story. I would encourage you to ask Jesus to speak to your heart on a personal level. Watch and see if he doesn't give you little nuggets. Even if you are not used to seeing into the spirit realm, these will show up naturally. Keep in mind these will often appear like a coincidence or even something silly or strange. Also, they will be a simple word or a loving reminder that will connect with your heart on a personal level, much like a husband giving his wife some flowers, a card, or a special gift. These little bread crumbs are to develop intimacy and your faith. I have found Jesus gives you just enough to notice it's him, but not so much that you don't have to use your faith to believe. As you are faithful in cherishing the little treasures, he will give you so much more. Thank you for listening to my podcast. I have many more series that you can find on my website, heavensdoor41.com. Okay, have a great day. Bye now.